Hello to everybody. So we are online with a Now and Together Womanation. So I'm really pleased to have all the social community. So welcome to our community of Lina Pelle Fair. So, and you are our national, international uh, community. And tonight, so it's really the, the third edition where we can give you our mantra. Let's inspire you with our very interesting professional people that around the world are coming and sharing from the global fashion industry the most interesting thoughts and insights and also inspiration. So let me introduce me, which is uh, I'm Orietta Pelizzari, so I'm an international fashion advisor. But the donation it's very good, which really let me introduce our today special guest and speaker, the curator of the Innovation Square of Linea Pelle. So, just a few words talking about how to introduce the topic of tonight, which is sustainability. And Federico Brugnoli, thanks to his competencies, it's we can also really have the opportunity tonight to look through what's going on in sustainability and also to understand together and design and drive all the topics that we're going on. Let me say is the first of I'm sure a long different types of session where we will talk about sustainability. So Federico now will share his screen. And I welcome him in our virtual showroom. Okay. Thank you very much, Arietta. And um, uh, I'm, I'm really glad. Hello. Hello to everybody. I'm going to uh, yeah, show you at least face to face who I am. But um, I think uh, it's more important for me to share the contents uh, that um, I, I would like to. Um, uh, uh, how can I say, again, share with you today. And so allow me just one second. Okay, so we're going to speak today about sustainability. After a uh, few months, I would say, we have been, uh, I would say, um, uh, in, a, in a lockdown. Today is my 57th day at home in, in Italy, unfortunately. And uh, so we have thought to uh, provide you with a, an insight of uh, um, which are the different meanings of this word um, in uh, different contexts and evolutions. So whenever I speak about sustainability, I always start with this kind of key question. Does anybody know? what sustainability is. Um, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the, the person that is looking at the screen is not me. I am much thinner than that, and I am much younger and taller. Uh, but uh, who I am, I have always been a very curious. Um, um, I have been uh, uh, traveling uh, the world uh, uh, a lot and in, in many different meanings, um, probably most of the time without any, any penny in my, in my pocket. I am a, a typical optimist um, and I, uh, I am uh, also founder of science. Um, my background is in environmental sciences. Um, I am graduated in environmental sciences and technologies in Italy in 1997. Um, I am fond of nature and I found uh, the beauty in nature and uh, I don't know if any of you recognize these but this photo who was my idol when I was a teenager and um, I've always thought that the intelligence and good thinking uh, is the best way to move forward in uh, whichever part of uh, industry, science, technology, and society. I have been active in fashion since 1997. 
and this is thanks to uh, a scholarship I got uh, already, wow, <laughs> 23 years ago uh, from the Italian Tanners Association who gave me uh, some money to study the first ISO 14001 certification of uh, a tannery. So since then I have been active in sustainability and fashion. Um, as uh, Orietta said, I am the curator of the Linapel Innovation Square. Um, and uh, the Linapel Innovation Square is, uh, uh, um, let's say, a platform uh, on which uh, we are working on uh, since uh, three years now. And uh, we have been bringing in uh, um, more than 80 speakers in two years from uh, all over the world. Uh, we have been involving uh, 10 plus million contacts on social media, working on uh, different uh, uh, topics and uh, interested in different topics such as uh, biotechnologies, uh, sustainability, new techs, uh, wearable devices and so on and so forth. So uh, 2019 has been, has been the second year and uh, hopefully we will improve also the offer from uh, this year onwards. So, but uh, if we go on the real topic of today, that is on uh, sustainability and fashion, um, I, I have tried to start and to prepare my presentation in a very visual manner. And so I will start with this image. That is to say, um, probably most of you are aware of who the Simpsons are. And uh, uh, probably none of you is, or a few of you are aware that the Simpson history started in 1987. So at that time, the Simpsons looked like that. And uh, why am I focusing on 1987? Because that is the time in which there was uh, another person that was like starting uh, the ramp up uh, in, uh, in overall uh, notoriety or in, in overall, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, societal um, uh, climbing, which was Trump. He was the, the, the time, September 28, 1987, in which he claimed to be gaining the first uh, billion dollar. But there was also a time in which there was another person that was very important. And uh, I don't know if any of you is aware of uh, um, who is uh, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland. Uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland at the time was the Norwegian Prime Minister. And uh, she was the one that was working at the United Nations on a very important topic that is to say uh, the provision of one concept that was devoted and was uh, dedicated uh, to which a lot of time was dedicated from a, a large community of scientists on uh, um, the concept of sustainability. So on March 20th, 1987, which is more than 33 years ago, no, that 23 years ago or whatever, there was the first issuing of the World Commission report on environment and development. This means that the concept of sustainability is 33 plus years old. So it's still younger than me, but is, um, we had a lot of time passing by that. So we are all speaking about sustainability and we are all speaking about the concept of sustainability, but probably very few really understand what this con concept really means. At that time, the main conclusion of the so-called Brundtland report said that sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Probably a lot of you have heard already 
this sentence that is that is saying that uh, we don't own the planet we are borrowing it from uh, our sons and nephews so that was the first time in which this concept was really developed 33 years ago what happened since next since then so this is the the um, the, the let's say graphical representation of uh, what that concept meant at that time meaning uh, sustainability is or sustainable development is the development that is in between these three spheres of interest of uh, uh, of humans humans want to be um, to, to to be wealthy they have a pretty steady economic interest they don't want to be uh, how can I say um, uh, um, in, in bad social conditions and this is the second uh, sphere of interest and uh, uh, there is uh, unfortunately still weaker part of humans that are considering the environment as important as the others and um, just as another provocation I would like to state that this is really something that is happening currently in which there are parts of the world including Italy and US in particular in which social behaviors and economic conditions are really it looks like they are fighting one against the other uh, because if we look at uh, uh, one of the most important parts of social conditions such as public health uh, this is considered very important but the looked and led to a, a global lockdown but there are parts of the world in which the economic conditions are kind of prevailing so that the uh, the, the political uh, way forward is thought to be to reopen as soon as possible no matter what uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how um, uh, in any case this concept even if it is 33 years old is still actual um, if we would if the humanity would focus on only the economic growth we would have uh, people going on the moon on a, on a sports car on a sport car if uh, we would like only to balance on social issues probably there could be a stop of this speed of growth uh, because of uh, inequalities for example same applies to environmental protection there are and there have been cases in history in which the environmental protection was to be considered as a priority but it hasn't been and the economic conditions have prevailed and therefore a lot of uh, negative uh, um, uh, consequences have raised so what uh, i just want to highlight is that a 33 years old concept is really speaking about a balance an equilibrium among the different sources of interest of the uh, human growth and now more than ever this balance can be uh, understood um, what happened since then a lot of thinking have been made again 33 years of time uh, is, a, is a long time and uh, the scientists the, uh, the, the economists and the social scientists have been thinking uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, different and detailed requirements and evolutions of uh, such a, a broad concept. Um, there is, um, uh, and here the graph is representing just uh, between um, in 200 years how much different problems have been taken consideration in, uh, uh, in uh, defining uh, new development policies 
these are both two very good and positive things. There are some other, a little bit. The first one of which is uh, uh, what we call the, I have called the explosion of green labels and certifications. Um, if you look at the, the website, which is called www.acolabelindex.com, you can see that today we have almost 500, 463 different ACO labels that are referring to 199 countries in 25 industry sectors. And fashion is one of the sectors that is more involved than others. Why am I saying so and why am I representing this as a kind of negative uh, uh, fact? Because uh, um, if you have 463 different eco labels, none of them will be as representative uh, as uh, to be uh, overall organized. So looking at something that, 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 that is uh, a development that is mostly privately driven, uh, expanding the kind of notions that are linked to sustainability and that at the end of the day is not leading to any, mutual, uh, or to any um, uh, unique and uh, verified approach to the topic. Second thing, uh, uh, this is a, a kind of slide that I always like to represent. Uh, that is to say, you have on the, on the um, X axis, the years from 1960 to 2140. And on the Y axis, you have the frequency of the use of the word sustainable in English text as a percentage of all words by year. And the source is Google. So if we're now looking at 2020, we see that uh, there is a percentage that is between uh, that is close to 0.01%. But if the trend, of course, to be the same in uh, I would say 80 years from today, all the sentences are just the word sustainable. So the word sustainable is unsustainable. There is no meaning that this word is getting to concrete projects if people are speaking about it so much and acting so low, so few. Um, since then, uh, we have been thinking a lot and we have been trying to uh, elaborate a solution for the future. And um, I, I would like to present you with some hints and hopefully uh, these hints uh, together with the, um, let's say, um, contributions that you may have uh, also by providing our colleagues of Linapelle with comments uh, either from whichever channel you have, uh, we may develop some more uh, in-depth discussion in the future. But uh, the, the real thing is that what we think, what I think is that sustainability is the most important topic to be addressed by the humans, by humans. It is a complex problem it is described by many different parameters. It is based on science. It cannot be rated. And this is very important for me. It does not have anything to do with communication. And it is not understood by the majority of consumers. But it can be measured. And I'm not just uh, putting you some sentences on a slide. I'm just going to try to explain why uh, of this. Uh, some ways you already know, uh, but I'm going to try to explain um, some uh, ways forward to, uh, to, to, to have a common approach. Uh, let's get more in detail into fashion. Uh, again, this is a picture that is representing a wheel that is I don't know how many thousands years old uh, and it's just my way to say that we do not have to reinvent the wheel uh, because sustainability is already represented by a set of topics 
each of which can be um, uh, again represented into more detail. So the first one is human rights. There is no sustainability and there have been no sustainability if human rights are violated, if there is child labor, if there is uh, discriminants, uh, discrimination of uh, vulnerable groups, uh, if there is uh, gender inequality and, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of details on, under the big topic of human rights, I think on which we all agree. There is no sustainability if there are no good labor practices, if workers are not treated well, if workers are not able to be organized and to have proper salaries, if no workers have been, if workers are forced to uh, uh, work extra hours and, and do extra shifts, um, uh, and uh, if workers are put in, a condi in conditions that are bad for their health and safety. Um, there is no sustainability if there is no environmental protection. There, if there is no ways of conceiving and producing products which are somehow better for the environment, there is no sustainability if uh, harmful substances are widespread used. Uh, it would, there is a, on the news, on the worldwide news today, uh, explosion of, uh, I think, a chemical factory in Italy, thousand people sitting in the hospital, uh, tens of people which are dead. So sustainability is also linked with the way in which we conceive the products and the way in which we make them. Um, there is no sustainability if there is no fair competition, if there are um, fakes, if there is no uh, good remuneration, if there is no recognition of intellectual property, if there is no recognition of uh, um, uh, anti-corruption policies, for example. But as well as uh, there is no sustainability <clears throat> if there is no consumer safety. What if uh, we produce the best product on air um, with respect to, I don't know, the visual appearance or um, cost that is uh, uh, very harmful for the consumers who are using it? Uh, but then uh, these are all very good concepts which are very broad and very general um, thanks to our experience we have been also looking at uh, identifying a way to measure uh, the let's say at least environmental sustainability of products which is called uh, life cycle assessment i hope many of you are familiar with that but not only <clears throat> uh, life cycle assessment as such, but also a measure of what uh, it, it is very uh, other in at, uh, in the product's useful life. And I'm trying to be um, uh, very clear on those in, in, in the next slides. First one is uh, if we take uh, uh, as an example of whichever fashion product, um, probably not focusing on leather in this case, but um, uh, let's say that we, we are speaking about uh, 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 textile products. Its life cycle starts from the harvesting of the crop that is needed to produce the fibers for uh making whichever whichever in this case we're speaking of course of natural fibers whichever product that is needed spinning weaving dyeing washing transportation uh, cutting sewing labeling whatever and then the product gets to the clothing swaps is sold repaired but then what is its final destination is it landfill up Cycled? Is it donated? Is it resold? But the most important question is 
are fashion products at the moment thought from the very beginning to follow one of these paths? The answer is no. Um, well, if we speak about uh, life cycle assessment, there are many very important parameters that are measuring the impact of uh, uh, a product. I think that one of the one one of the of them, which is very famous, is the so-called global warming potential, which is linked to uh, again global warming and climate change. But this is not the only parameter that is determining whether a product or a product life cycle has an important or a weak impact on the environment. There are others. We can go into detail um, on, on all of these because I think there is a very important need of at least a kind of scientific backgrounds for people that are involved in the fashion industry to understand what we are speaking about. I don't know how many of you know what is photochemical oxidation. I don't know how many of you know what abiotic depletion is. But these are very important parameters which are mod modifying the shape and the capacity and the ability of our planet to, um, to be in, a, <laughs> again, in a good shape in the following years. But these are all parameters that we are now able to measure thanks to a common agreement of the scientific community and sound methodologies. Um, so just a few hints that uh, I, 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 I have tried to, to draw for those of you who are, for example, designers. Uh, the first thing is that products have to be thought to be sustainable. I have uh, uh, created, hopefully, the definition of a sustainable DNA. Products have to be conceived to be sustainable. If a product is not thought to be recyclable, for example, it cannot be. I don't know if uh, uh, any of you has already faced the problem of uh, concrete product upcycling and recycling in the fashion industry. Uh, I did for some very important luxury brands in collaboration with And uh, the results that we had, products are not conceived to be recyclable, upcyclable, or circular. They are simply uneconomic. So the most important hint for designers is please interact with any uh, actor on the market or in the scientific community that can be on the same page with you to share a common view of what a sustainable product is and based on these parameters try to conceive and to um, create really sustainability from the mind. Why? Because thinking is more powerful than doing. Um, the, 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 the paradigm has been now, until now, and I, I'll be a little bit critic, that designers and the creativity part of the fashion industry has the power of deciding everything. And then the doers, the producers, uh, the operational, part of the industry has to achieve as, as good as possible goals in terms of uh, uh, sustainability and profitability. But probably this paradigm has to shift into a, a more, more uh, top-down approach in the future. And uh, I am sure that uh, our colleagues from Lina Pelle would like to have a lot of comments from your side on this. Uh, uh, starting as of today and in the future so that we can explore this topic a little bit more because honestly i think this is one of the most important topics on which the industry should focus on but probably there are also parts of um, the audience today which belong to the category of retailers 
or at least have to um, deal with them. And um, again, a provocation. For the first time in history, a pair of leather shoes costs in Italy, and this is a two months old online research that I did, one euro cent more than a Big Mac menu. So I know that most of us will see this pair of leather shoes as very super ugly because they are. But in any case, the point is they are costing 8.41 euros. And here I get back to the concept of durability of products. If consumers are not forced, but led to a model in which they can buy a pair of shoes for less than 10 euros or a t-shirt for less than five or whatsoever, then what is going to be their consumption model? They're gonna use it. They're, and I see it in my son. They're gonna use it. They're gonna use it one time, two times. Then they're gonna put it back in the, in the cardboard. Then from the cardboard in uh, six months time, they're gonna end in the, in the trash can. And in the trash can, they're gonna end up in situations which are similar to these, in which we have tens and tons and tons of square meters of warehouses where returned goods or um, uh, goods which have been wasted are there awaiting to a final destination which is not landfill. And um, Orietta, I mean, uh, this, this is just, just a conclusion of the first part of my talk, which was uh, trying to explain uh, uh, at least uh, what was happening until February or March this year. Yeah, and let me tell you that I wanted to try to jump inside of your conversation several times. First of all, I want to thank all the community because maybe you didn't see Federico, but we have so many people attending. So many people are so interested. So you, you were talking about curiosity. And also, let me say there are several questions. But just before to, to tell you, go ahead because your next part will be post COVID, what's going on. I want just to highlight two, three points, which are very, very interesting. Talking about re just re as a recap of the different question and answer that they gave to us. So you were talking about life cycle, which is very important. It's one of the very important elements when I watch is when I look at this picture, because one of the biggest topics that we have right now in fashion is a less consumption. So consumer will consume less and less. So this is a fact. So this is really a fact. And we also have another topic, which means luxury brand and affordable luxury and also other types of brand already said our, our volume of production will decrease with a very consistent way. So sustainability, I think, will play a huge role, a very big role. What do you think about? Um, I would not speak about less consumption, but uh, Orietta, one of the concepts we are trying to, um, let's say, put on the table as a matter of discussion is uh, quality and durability versus uh, mass consumption and high waste level. So we think that durability and quality will be the key. They, 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 they have been in the past. We have witnessed a period in which they were not. So that was a, a kind of super fast fashion consumption model. But we think uh, that in the future, durability 
and quality will be linked with less consumption. So this would mean that if you go and analyze a consumer perspective, um, the amount of expenditure per year of usage of a product can be the same, even if the consumer choice could be to go to a high, um, high, medium high price product level, which will last much longer. I'm not gonna tell you brand names, but I have pairs of leather shoes, which are now 15 years old, uh, Rietta. Great. And, they, and the older they get, the, bet, the, the better they look. You understand what I mean? Yeah, so let me, I'm just, of course, I'm already chatting with our community and they had a question. So like, could consumer choose to use more leather because it's more durable? Yes, let me say yes. And you already answer yes. So come on, we know, we know where we go, but we, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take more time because I think you have very interesting things to, to tell us, uh, talking about which are the triggers and which are the needs of what's going on. Okay, let, let, me, let me try to be very gene general in, uh, in replying to uh, taking your question as an example. I think that probably, uh, hopefully, in my view, eh, of course, uh, there will be a trend of uh, getting back uh, to quality, care, durability. And uh, we are speaking now, Rieta, just, just to open a very small parenthesis, we are speaking also today about the shift of the business model of retailers. Uh, in Italy or in Europe in general, our city centers were very were and are still full of small shops, very highly specialized in a specific uh, product category. Shoes, leather goods, bags, uh, whichever. Um, in, in, a, in a high growing fast fashion world, they will disappear. But what if the business model would be to help consumers to choose the right product for them, which will be lost long lasting and support the consumers in having performances, good look and repair of these uh, products in time. Not, not thinking uh, about circular economy models because maybe they are too far and we, we, can, we could open uh, an overall and whole uh, session on, uh, on, on this topic. But uh, this, this is one example of shifting of different business models, which is going to be also part of my next part of the talk. And this is, um, let me say I'm totally, uh, I'm totally agree and most of our community are just really replying, yes, it's what is going on. But let me also say that repairing, it's also one of the things that, came up during the latest weeks when we started open conversation. So repairing, it's becoming one of the issue that is very important because it's determined by the competencies of the designer when he's designing the objects. Let me say the education of the consumer. So, it's really something that you touch plenty. I think we need to open agreed, a long session. Uh, Rieta, the, the quality and care business model, if properly revamped, could bring as much money as the, um, uh, let's say, fast uh, uh, buying and, uh, and wasting uh, turnover. But it would be a better turnover because uh, at least uh, a good portion of that will not be devoted to spending money for wasting goods. Correct, correct. Okay. Can I maybe of move course. to, if there are no other Q and A's or uh, any, any, any
any input, any input is of course uh, very welcome. So next slide is a kind of a sad one. So I think all of us know this image now. It is the image of the COVID-19 virus, or at least how it has been represented worldwide. And uh, we see this as a new trigger. I don't know from uh, how many countries our audience uh, is, but um, I have been, today is March, is May 8th. So it's my 61st day at home. And uh, in my country, until uh, Monday, life changed a lot. And probably in many other countries, life is changing very rapidly. Um, one of the things that was always said is that uh, uh, the word that is in Chinese, uh, that means in Chinese crisis, it also means opportunity. Uh, I am not that optimistic so far, but um, I, I can say that uh, at least uh, what we can do is uh, that we have to see this as a new trigger. A new trigger uh, brings in new needs. New needs are bringing in uh, new concepts or keywords, and new keywords will bring in some new business models and opportunities. So uh, without being uh, so optimistic um, to, to say that uh, I am able to inspire all of you, I have tried to uh, look at, at some of these new keywords, which are linked to post-COVID-19 sustainability, I would say. And I will try to explain them to you. So we say that where there is no sustainability or there will be no sustainability if uh, we are all, we will not be able or to all develop new life and social models. Um, few words on that. Luckily, company um, is uh, heavily based on the intellectual property. Uh, the hardware we need is a computer and the software we need is neurons so that uh, uh, we have been able also to work um, adapting heavily to what uh, in the US has been called social distancing. I would prefer to call it physical distancing because probably what we need now is physical distance but social closure. So I would like to be very uh, connected and very close to all my sociality or to my friends and the relationship, even if physically distanced. But for, for sure, we cannot speak about sustainability if we don't think of good and applicable new life and social models. When we speak about uh, supply chain solidarity, um, it is evident that, especially in the fashion business, I'm sorry, there is an ambulance. Uh, as uh, one of the tents that we hear every day here in Milano. But um, when we speak about supply chain solidarity, it is evident that in our view, now more than ever, um, supply chains have to look at themselves as if they were one uh, unique entity being made of big groups with uh, a lot of financial capacity, super big turnovers, but ending up as it is happening now in Italy with companies who have a super detailed and specific knowledge. And these companies are made probably of five people. Some of them are 55 years old and they're struggling to look for new young people coming into, in, uh, into their businesses and try to have the same artisanal way of doing beautiful things. So solidarity is meant in this way, uh, is meant in a way in which everyone in a supply chain should play its role from the big group 
that is maybe supporting, even if uh, we are speaking about payments or prices. I don't know. I am just making some provocations. But uh, this period of uh, two months closure of uh, uh, a whole sector in Italy is uh, giving us some thoughts that are telling us that uh, we don't need a reconciliation. We don't need um, a restructuring of the sector. We need competences and skills and capacity to be as they were before. And in this, we cannot only rely on, of the, on the help of whichever state or European Commission or whichever other fund. We need our word to work for our word. Um, third part is that there is no sustainability. There will be no sustainability if there will be no new technologies, from new communication technologies to new production technologies to new health and safety technologies. Um, there will be no sustainability if we don't agree globally on a new Organ on new organizational and business models. Um, as I was saying before, um, luckily in our company, we didn't stop our operations because of uh, coronavirus, but probably uh, most, of, most of the companies for which uh, the physical interaction was very important, did stop it. But, uh, uh, um, this is an occasion for us to rethink also the uh, suppliers consumers interaction. We are also looking into new product features, but these are just a set of uh, seven provocations, and it would be very interesting, I am sure, for Orietta, our colleagues uh, uh, Julia and Silvia and Fulvia from. Lina Pelle to receive some other, other provocations because we will be able to elaborate on that in the future. And uh, with this, I just concluded my presentation. I hope this was satisfactory for all of you. And um, I don't know uh, if uh, speaking to colleagues, uh, if they are receiving any, any provocation or q and I'm really happy to, to reply to each of them. Yes, Federico, let me say from my side, very thank you so much for this. Uh, in my way, I will not, I don't want to close this session, so, because you open so many different doors. I know, I know, I know. That's my point, and this was uh, the reason why just talking with all the community in a very friendly way, we were thinking and thinking how we can start to talk about one of the biggest topic. And then we said, okay, let's go. We need to open. We need to start to share because this is the first point, uh, giving the curiosity people reacting. Uh, provocation, you ask about provocation. We have plenty, of course. Uh, letter will play one very important role. And this is the question that everybody are asking. Consumer, making consumer aware of what they are, uh, buying, but even competencies. So when, when you talk about competencies, so there are somebody they are saying, okay, finally. So if you are a designer, you need to know technical skills. So you need to be more and more in deep in what's going on. Come on, this is the different way that finally COVID gave us. Rieta, uh, can I give you just a very quick reply? Uh, on your last point, which is linked to what we, what you have called competences. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, go ahead. I, I, I was starting a project which was very well financed by the European Commission, millions of euros in the uh, 2000s, so 2002, 2003, uh, on sustainability and consumers. And the approach which was led by, by that, the call for which we have applied for funding was to educate consumers in choosing sustainable products. Okay. Um, this was 17 years ago. The conclusion after all that time and all the money that has been spent 
is that this is not the way to go. Sustainability has to be a top-down approach. The, if money has to be invested, this money has to be invested to train, properly train designers on even complex technical topics. And we are ready to do that because it's only when I, when I was speaking before about thinking is better than doing, this is the only way to conceive and put on the market really sustainable products. Consumers are very well aware, but at the end of the day, when, we, when they are in the shop, they will always choose for price and brands and beauty. They will never look for, for whichever sustainability parameter. So it's, it's a, a kind of responsibility that the industry has to shift from a bottom-up approach in which we keep on saying to each other, oh, the consumers of the future will ask for more sustainable products. Yes, if you ask them to do so. But if you go to whichever, I'm not going to be making any name, to whichever shop, a consumer will choose by price, uh, visual appearance, and uh, uh, brand. So it has to be uh, a really uh, a shift in the evolution of the way in which products are conceived by the industry. And in this, if we speak about leather, this material has the possibility of being uh, supportive to this shift because of its durability, beauty, and capacity to evolve in time. Can I jump with another question? Because yes, I'm sure the community want to stay and listen because it's really important. And I think we have to, I want to listen to your opinion. I have mine, but let me give you the stage. So what about invest in leather scraps made as a biodegradable product? So I think this is a question and it's opening a huge Door because this is our uh, our friend in the community is asking what about to invest on it what do you think about um, in overall terms as a let's say uh, a scientist that is borrowed to the fashion industry the the the, the, the general uh, remark is that the less weight waste you produce the better it is or if you produce or if you increase the efficiency of transformation of the material as soon as possible in, uh, in the supply chain, that is the best solution. Uh, we have uh, experiences uh, in different supply chains worldwide, I'm not gonna name them, of uh, uh, leather makers who are choosing, for example, to trim or cut uh, as early as possible in their production processes uh, then the unusable parts uh, so that uh, the uh, water, heat, electricity and chemicals will not be used uh, to transform uh, unusable parts in order to increase the overall cutting efficiency at uh, the after the gate of the tunnel. Having said so, uh, which is reduction, so I don't know if, you, if any of you have uh, um, has uh, 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 ever heard of the what we call the the waste pyramid which is uh, uh, reduce reuse recycle so reduce is better than reusing reusing is better than recycling and of course recycling is better than disposing but uh, um, having said so uh, there are uh, existing and emerging technologies which are useful for recycling leather scraps and there are more and more uh, uses of um, these leather scraps uh, back in the industry in a circular model. Um, uh, some of them are even uh, uh, very profitable because uh, uh, basically if we work uh, in, a, in a waste, uh, let's say business environment, the companies get paid from two sides. One is the companies that are paying to uh, 
uh, to let's say dispose their wastes to recycling companies and these recycling companies if they find a profitable manner of transforming these scraps which are basically collagen and chemicals into other valuable products they get paid also from the market so um, i am not a, a market advisor yet but uh, i would say it's a good way of uh, of looking at uh, some viable options um, uh, and we do already have in mind uh, uh, at least three companies who are progressing very well in this respect in europe So let me tell you, Federico, that we really have a lot of plenty of questions. So that's one comment because it's a little bit wide that they, 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 they text it. Of course, we need also to take in consideration the social aspect. And this was on the, on one of the parts that I like to touch. So the social aspect is also many made orders and now they don't want they cancel the orders and they don't want to pay so they don't want to pay these kind of orders and this is another very important issue that maybe is not something that we can uh, let me say say oh this is a wow factor but it's something that is an issue we have to solve it uh, Do you have this is what I call the uh, supply chain solidarity um, um, and I, t I totally agree. I mean, um, sometimes uh, when you, people are in the positions like the one I am, Lina Pelle is, and you are, uh, we always have to find a balance between the different players in a supply chain. But sometimes it's also good if someone uh, stands up and says something that he thinks is right. And what I do think is right is that there are the, if we want to keep the software fair and if we want to keep the, um, the, the, the way in which the super high quality that is uh, distinguishing a certain point, certain part of our world is made of, we need also to rethink the way in which Payments are made, orders are made, prices are agreed, and so on and so forth. I, I, I'm not saying that I do have a solution in hand, but there is surely something that has to change. Because uh, in the last years, sometimes uh, uh, I have seen an increasing pressure, um, the pressure that is increasing towards uh, the smaller and smaller and smaller companies. So that bigger companies who are super rich, they have super big accounts. At the end of the day, they are putting pressure on prices, payment conditions, and uh, uh, other topics on, on, their, on their suppliers. And um, again, this is just uh, not to lose all of uh, my customers in the, in, the, in the luxury business or in the big corporations, because I have, uh, and as you know, we have many of them. Um, but uh, I think that this is to be rethought with the concept of solidarity. It's not a matter of uh, um, uh, only profitability, it's a matter of supply chain trust and supply chain uh, solidarity, which means at the end of the day, keeping those parts of the supply chains who made some products excellent in the world alive in the future. Yeah, the point is really the solidarity. And so let me tell you that to the community, solidarity, it's another element that came up very strongly uh, during COVID and also after that, which means we think more about our community in our country, protecting the country and protecting the job of every person. So this is another types of, oh, of course, let me say another thing that we can open. So we have another question. Do you want to answer? No, I, think I don't want to go to have a dinner. You want to go to dinner? Nothing I'm more? I am kidding, or yet. Of course I want to answer. 
Of course, I'm just asking. You, you know, otherwise we can just start to drink something right now. Why yeah. not? Why don't we have a super party all together? Yeah, why not ending with a glass of wine? Yeah. A glass of but wine, yeah. Anyway, it was very interesting talking about food, the Big Mac with the shoe. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me, are the shoes made by leather or by synthetic? Do you know it? Uh, Orietta, I, 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 just, I just looked at the, um, let's say, a, a comparable price. I, I didn't look into details of uh, how that shoe was made, but uh, that was just a slide to provoke a reaction that if you go, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie um, Pulp Fiction, a Big Mac is a Big Mac, but they call it a little Big Mac, no? I, I mean, um, now we spend 8.41 euros to buy a pair of shoes, and we spend 8.40 euro to buy a Big Mac menu. And the, the time that you use for consuming a Big Mac menu is, I don't know, 15 minutes, five minutes in my case, but 15 minutes in general. And uh, is that comparable with the value of the use of a product such as a pair of shoe? In my, in my opinion, it is not at all. You understand what I mean? So I got we, we are really looking into a model in which um, there has been a, a, a how can I say, um, an important, the drill to to cost uh, saving and to whatever and this didn't take care of anything probably that is a very harmful leather substitute uh, made in uh, whichever province of whichever country uh, with a very low cost labor labor cost with a, a very bad wages uh, with very bad uh, working conditions, but that is on sale. You understand what I mean? And um, uh, to me, uh, uh, if we are the leaders and if we represent with Linapelle, the community of leaders of the fashion industry, uh, we should be leading that change, um, uh, full stop. I mean, uh, either we take this responsibility or someone else will, or we will have uh, future models on which we don't agree. And uh, of course, uh, um, it, the probability that that material was not leather is super high, but uh, that, wasn't the focus, that was not the focus of my research. The focus of my research was that I found a pair of a, a, a product that was supposed to be durable, is one cent euro more expensive than a big Mac menu. So I think you, you explain all the things. So let me let me go to close uh, this uh, this talk, this conversation, and also leaving a couple of things. That means tonight was the, the first time that we opened this huge topic. And I totally agree with Federico and with all the community that now they are asking, so when will be the next? <laughs> so let me also, of course, when, when will be the next? And also the community is an industry because let me say also the community is an industry. And also let me say the ladder is already part of a cycle of recycling. So because everybody that work in pure and natural ladder knows these kind of things. So what to say? Thank you very much, Federico. Thanks to all the community that we are more than 20 minutes more and we took more of your time, but I think you spent in a great way. And thanks to all the Linea Pelle Fair team that help us to make this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank, uh, thanks to everybody for um, listening to me for so long. <laughs> and I'm very glad uh, uh, if there is interest in, uh, in moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.